Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry you had to see me in between those little intros. That wasn't the plan. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and I know we do have a whole ton of groups that are joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I want to say a huge thank you to all our teachers joining us from across North America and around the world. We know that 2021 and 2020 have been really odd years for all of you. A lot of you would like to be in the classrooms and can't. And so it's been such a pleasure giving you guys a chance to do some really engaging and exciting digital presentations over these last uh, week and a half to start off the new year. And we really, really appreciate you uh, continuing to tune in as we celebrate such cool people. So we did a whole bunch of animal presentations to start the year. We are focusing on STEM careers. So we've done, you know, baby sloths eating flowers, big cats. Yesterday we did hurricane explorers. Today we're taking a bit of a different tack and going with a theme that we usually cover in a big way in October, and we are going into space. Specifically, we are joined by Tom Vassos, who in your lives, if you can find something that you are as passionate about as Tom is about space, you are set. Tom is an amazing presenter, and he's going to walk through us, with us today a little bit about life in the universe and our exploration to find alien life, intelligent life, why we haven't found it yet, what scientists are doing to try and discover it, and more. So it's going to be a really, really exciting presentation. Before we get underway, we have so many of you tuning in on YouTube that I want to give you guys the maximum chance to ask your questions today. And so we're partnering with another app called the Slido app. So if all of you or anyone who wants to, wants to go to slido.com and use the event code universe, you can share questions there, upvote your favorites, and take part in some of the interactive polls uh, throughout the broadcast. So slido.com, event code universe, cool way to participate uh, if you're on YouTube with us today. So with that, without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Tom, and can't wait. Take us away. That's great. Thanks so much, Jesse. I'm really looking forward to this. You're going to have fun. We're going to go searching trillions of kilometers across the universe to see if we can find any aliens. Who knows? Maybe we'll spot some. For, mil for thousands and thousands of years, humans have been asking, uh, a lot of questions about the universe, but the most common one they seem to be asking is this one, are we alone? Is this it? Is it just people on Earth and all the animals on Earth? Or might there be other life somewhere else in the universe? Uh, so Jesse, I'm going to get you to type this question in. Aside from life on Earth, do you think life exists anywhere else in the universe? And any group that is in a classroom, just get, get a bit of a survey in each of your classrooms. How many within your group say that no, uh, life doesn't exist anywhere else in the universe, it's just here on Earth, or yes, there must be other life somewhere else in the universe. So just poll your own individual classrooms. You can share that in the YouTube chat bar, you can share it on Slido like I shared before, and for our live groups, you can share in the chat. So we've got votes of yes so far, so far, yeses coming in, which is great. Um, all yeses, 20, 28 yeses, 7% no on Slido. So thanks for participating, guys. Okay, so 93% yes. That's actually pretty close to the uh, the ratio I tend to get when I do this as live. Uh, Jesse, put this next question in. Do you believe that aliens have ever visited us on Earth? Because you probably see a lot of reports about UFOs and stories about uh, aliens here, so yes or no for this one. Do you believe that aliens have ever visited us on Earth? All right, keep me on my toes, Tom. We got it up on the Slido. So, so far, 69% no. We've got we got some uh, alien, alien, uh, not, yes, resounding no from some groups that are live, some that are yes, no here, mainly no's. 70%. Okay, so what's, what's my last percentage on the no? Our final percentage on the no is 62% no out of 70 groups responding. Okay, so that's interesting. I normally get about a 50-50 split, but I would say this is probably an above average intelligent audience <laughs> because the answer probably is no, but we're gonna learn more about why I think that's the case uh, in just a second. So Jesse, for this one, uh, actually type this in as one more question. What are aliens most likely to look like? And just give the choices A, B, and C. And while you're typing that in, I'm actually gonna show you three different pictures. And since 63% of you think that the aliens exist, let's see which one you think they look like. Do you think they look like this ugly little creature here, which kind of looks like a carbon-based life form? It probably eats things, at least based on looking at its teeth, right? <laughs> 
So a carbon-based life form may be similar to, to life uh, here, animals on Earth, or might it be more like B, silicon-based, uh, more like a robot with artificial intelligence, uh, with, with programs built into it so it, it can talk uh, and, and things like that. Or do you think it would most likely look like C, which is tiny little microbial life, uh, life that you can barely see, uh, as in these drawings here uh, on drawing C. So what do you think aliens are most look likely to look like, A, B, or C? Jesse, what do you got? Let's see what's coming up. So, so far, C, 75% C. We got like overwhelming, yep, YouTube, Slido, everything. Excellent. How's the split between A and B? The split between A and B, more people think A than B. B is by far the lowest 3%. Okay, so only 3% on B? You got it. All, all right. Thank you so much. Well, guess what? You guys, I would think, at least in my assessment, and hopefully I can convince you of that in this talk, is that it's probably C, microbial life, because the life because the elements that cause life to form in microbial form is probably common throughout the universe. And we also believe that if A was to exist, it probably originally had to exist as a C and evolve into something that looks more like A. But I am going to disagree with you on A versus B, because especially if you think about which ones we're, we are most likely to meet, it's probably going to be B that will meet before A. And I'll tell you why, because space is so huge, it would be hard for a humanoid type life form to transverse the universe to come over and meet us. So the ones we might meet is B, but who knows, maybe there is more A than B uh, throughout the universe. So thanks for that, uh, Jesse, and thanks for that poll. Regarding UFOs and spaceships and, and life uh, that people have, thought they have seen. There's all kinds of stories about people seeing flying saucers and things like that. And even people saying, oh yeah, and I was even abducted into the spaceship and they operated on me and all that kind of stuff. And there's many other reasons why these stories probably are not true. And so I'm in the camp of no, alien life have probably not visited us. But there's probably many, many other reasons why people have made these UFO sightings. It could be natural phenomena or human-made objects or technical glitches in the camera or the radar or psychological or drug-induced reasons or, or even hoaxes or people may be doing it for financial gain. So there's all kinds of reasons, but probably the reason it's not is that there's aliens flying around visiting us because you probably know because they'd probably be on the White House lawn or something talking to the president, <laughs> okay? But I wanted to give you some examples that prove my theory here about why I don't believe those sightings are in fact aliens. So here's a UFO spotted over Norway, and you might look at this and say, wow, that's, that probably is some type of alien form. Well, guess what? It was just a NASA experiment where they were dispersing harmless gas tracers into the atmosphere for research purposes. So it wasn't aliens. How about this one? It was this incredible upward, upward spiral streaking UFO over Norway. And many people reported this uh, as a potential alien spacecraft. No, it was just a failed Russian missile that spun out of control after launch. Or how about this alien spaceship that appeared to be landing in Australia? Well, as it turned out, this was actually just a plane and its emissions that were just lit up by the rising sun. So it was dark for the people on the surface of the Earth. So they said, no, it must have been an alien spaceship because it was all lit up. Well, it was just the sun that was lighting it up. <laughs> or how about this one, uh, which turned out to be just a live fire demonstration by the U.S. Navy. So a lot of these UFO sightings are actually near Navy, Navy and Army sites. So it's people, it's things that people aren't necessarily familiar with. You might even get news of an astronaut telling you they, they think they saw a spaceship up in outer space with an incredible UFO light show that they saw. Well, guess what? This is something called an elf and a sprite, which is a natural phenomenon in our atmosphere, hundreds of kilometers up in the air. So it's a natural phenomenon. Or how about this spacecraft landing in Portugal? No, this one's just some clouds, of course, but uh, I could see how you could be mistaken. There's a thing within uh, the hum uh, a psychological concept called pareidolia, 
where we tend to see what we want to see and we always uh even if it's not anything we tend to see something in it so if if a friend of yours ever tell you they saw a ufo and it was something like a kangaroo visiting us from another planet it's probably not a spaceship it's probably clouds <laughs> or like this horse here that might be visiting us in the form of clouds <laughs> Enrique Fermi was a famous astrophysicist uh, uh, several decades ago, and he asked, he was hanging out with his astrophysicist friends over lunch and asked a question to them uh, that came to be known as the Fermi paradox. But he asked the question, well, look, I, I don't think any of these UFOs are aliens either, but if the universe is so huge and life is likely possible throughout the entire universe, over 70% of you think it is, then where is everybody? Why haven't we seen them? Why haven't we met them? So I'll tell you what my solution to the Fermi paradox is to explain why I don't think we've met them. And that is because microbial life and intelligent civilization are likely common throughout the universe, but we're so far apart in space and time that we will likely never ever meet them. Uh, at least not the intelligent ones. The microbial ones might be a different story, and I'll tell you more about that in just a second. Uh, so let's talk about the universe being so big. Even our closest star, Proxima Centauri, you might have heard it's only four light years away from us. Well, guess what? That's 40 trillion kilometers away. If you were to even use our fastest spaceship and go straight to Proxima Centauri, it would still take you over 30,000 years to get there. And forget about trying to travel there in a Boeing 747 at 1,000 kilometers an hour. That would take you 17 million years to get there. That's how far space is, <laughs> the objects inside space. That's how far they're spread out. And that's our closest neighbor. Now imagine if life existed, you know, 1,000 light years away or something. It, very difficult for them to ever reach us and for us to ever reach them. And this... Uh, hits the point home again as well. This is a 3D visualization called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, an actual fly through computer animation based on actual data. And each of these smudges is a galaxy containing about 100 billion stars. And potentially each of these smudges contains about 1 trillion worlds, that's planets and moons, each with the potential to host life. So imagine that each of these smudges, oh, there's a trillion worlds. Oh, there's another trillion worlds. Oh, there's another trillion worlds. So when I look at something like this, I say, how is it possible that there wouldn't be life somewhere in one of these smudges, each containing a trillion different worlds that might host life? The second thing is that our existence is but the blink of an eye. If we were to take all of humankind's uh, history on Earth, which is a couple of hundred thousand years, and we put the entire history of the universe across one entire calendar year. When do you think we showed up as humans? Did we show up in, in August or March or July? Well, guess what? Our predecessors, Australopith Australopithecus, didn't show up until December 31st at, uh, at about 9.30 in the evening. And our ancestors, Homo erectus, didn't show up till 12 minutes to midnight and we didn't show up until eight minutes to midnight. So even if the aliens visited us, even every you know 100 million years or whatever, several times, unless they arrived here between eight minutes to midnight and midnight, they wouldn't have seen us. They would have seen just microbial life or they just would have met the dinosaurs. So the chance of them meeting us in the exact slice of time that we were here is also next to impossible. What about microbial life though, called extremophiles uh, or other types of microbial life? And, and according to this university, the average gram of soil contains 1 trillion cells, 10,000 different species of bacteria. So if the soil here contains that amount of life, why wouldn't the soil on, on other planets around the universe also possibly contain cells like this, as long as they have access to water and, and other elements that makes it more likely for life to exist. The other place that life exists is at the bottom of our oceans, these things called hydrothermal vents, hundreds of pounds of pressure, thousands of degrees in temperature, and yet you can see by these videos that life flourishes down at the bottom of the ocean. 
And what about life in our solar system there? If it exists at the bottom of our oceans, then what about in our, in our own solar system? And this is just a bit of a fun story and a side I wanted to share with you that so far we have not found life anywhere in our solar system. So in fact, anywhere in the universe, only the only place we have ever found life is on planet Earth. However, there is some life that does exist beyond planet Earth. It's a bit of a fun story. The Israeli spacecraft Bereshit uh, crash landed on the moon a few months back and they brought up with them an experiment uh, with some little tiny little extremophile creature called tardigrades that look like this, tiny little creatures. And their spacecraft crash landed on the moon. So right now on the moon, there's a bunch of these tardigrades that we think might still be alive that might be crawling around on the moon. Actually, they're probably not even crawling around because the, the moon temperature swings are so incredible that they're probably in hibernation. Uh, but the good news is they can hibernate for a hundred years before they wake up again. So there is life on the moon. It just happens to be something that we crash landed there. <laughs> what about life on Mars? No, we haven't found any life there, but guess what? Underground liquid water has been found on Mars and wherever there's water, there's a higher likelihood of actually finding life. Also on Mars, for some reason in the spring, we find methane levels as you can see by this NASA drawing. Does that mean there's life on Mars? No, it actually doesn't because methane can be formed from a couple of different things. One could be geological processes like underground volcanoes and, and, and things like that. But methane can also be created by microbial life. So now NASA and other countries are on a search for life on Mars to see if maybe there's microbial life on Mars causing some of this methane to form on Mars itself. What about life anywhere else in our solar system? Well, guess what? We think the best places to look for life might be in some of Jupiter's moons like Europa, or maybe in Saturn's moons like Enceladus. Why do we think that? I'll tell you why. For example, uh, Jupiter's moon Europa, as we analyzed and sent spacecraft to analyze Europa, it has liquid spewing out from the surface of the planet. And when we use a scientific technique called spectroscopy, we can actually analyze what that liquid is made of. And we see things like methane and we see water, H2O, the building block of life. We see carbon dioxide. Is this proof that there's life there? No, it, no there isn't. But guess what? If there is microbial life, uh, that car carbon dioxide might be a signature of that life. We don't know yet. We'll have to send a spaceship there and drill down through the ice and maybe see if we can find some microbial life that is causing some of these readings. And what about en Enceladus from uh, our assessments? It looks like there's this huge underground ocean. So there's these cryovolcanoes that are spewing water out of Enceladus as well. And guess what? We think the reason for that is because there's oceans underneath the icy surface and there's something called tidal heating. Enceladus has this weird uh, elongated orbit and its host planet is squeezing it and stretching it and squeezing it and stretching it. That's called tidal heating. And because of that tidal heating it, heating, at the bottom of those oceans, there could be hydrothermal vents, just like the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of our oceans. And if life exists on the bottom of our oceans near those hydrothermal vents in hundreds of degrees of hundreds of pounds of pressure and thousands of degrees in temperature, why wouldn't it exist here? Have we ever found it here? No, we haven't. This is just uh, a prediction that some scientists believe might be the case. And how do we know what's in that liquid? Well, NASA Cassini spacecraft actually did a fly through, through those water vapor pl plumes and actually analyzed what those things were made of. So it sniffed out and detected, for example, hydrogen, almost like a human nose using its mass, uh, mass spectros spectrometer. So we can actually use science to search for this life 
uh, rather than just speculating, which it, it all is early on, but now we can use science to see if we can get closer and closer to answering that age old question, are we alone? What about life on exoplanets, trillions of kilometers away? What are exoplanets? They're planets that are orbiting stars trillions and trillions and trillions of kilometers away. So a few years ago, NASA launched a, a space telescope called, Te uh, called Kepler, and it actually was able to search for planets around stars trillions of kilometers away, and guess what it found? Evidence that thousands of exoplanets exist in uh, orbiting stars trillions of kilometers away from us. Rocky planets, ocean worlds, that might just be all ocean, uh, the entire planet. Uh, hot Jupiters and cold gas giants, which are unlikely uh, to host life and lava worlds that are unlikely to host life. But guess what? A lot of those rocky planets and ocean worlds might be places where life could get a foothold. Okay, we're at the fun part. I wanted to show you my uh, alien photo album before we ended things off. So it comes with a disclaimer. You might have to cover your eyes there in case there's any scary pictures. <laughs> so, so get your hand ready. Uh, what might the aliens look like? As I said before, we don't know, but, but who knows? Maybe they look something like this, or maybe they look some of these creatures here. Of course, these ones look like carbon-based life, like, like something we might have on, uh, on planet Earth. Or maybe they'll look like these ugly creatures, more like an animal. I love this one on the left here. He even has a nice little jacket with a zipper on it. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> or they may be scarier and uglier like some of these creatures that, that Hollywood has created. Or maybe they'll be cute and cuddly uh, like this one, E.T. extraterrestrial from the movie uh, that, that just wants to be nice and make friends with us, right? <laughs> Or maybe they'll look like some of these beautiful creatures here. Have, have you ever noticed that when art, artists draw aliens, they look an awful lot like humans? <laughs> so it, it's an unfortunate thing about it because we tend to think, well, life is probably gonna look like we look. Well, guess what? It might not look anything at all like what we look. But I know one thing for sure, those aliens probably don't exist in Area 51 in the United States where you've heard all of those stories about the aliens landed and then the government's hiding them and all that kind of stuff. I tell you, if the government had proof of aliens, they would want us to know about it because we might learn some interesting technology and meet some nice friends if they ever came to planet Earth. Or might they look more humanoid like this, these creatures here, or more robotic as we talked about earlier but as I mentioned earlier, I think it's much more likely that the first aliens that we discover on in our solar system is more likely going to look something like this. And guess what? These are actual uh, images of things that are in human bodies. They might be in, in, in your stomach gut. A lot of people don't realize you have billions of these tiny little creatures uh, that are roaming around your stomach right now, digesting your food and different things like that. Okay, and are the elements that create life common throughout the whole universe? We actually have scientific evidence of that now as well through spectroscopy to take pictures of distant worlds where we find hydrogen and carbon and evidence of water and oxygen and things like that. But this is just the one example I wanted to show you here. This is an actual image of a comet taken by a Rosetta spacecraft, and they were actually able to analyze the ingredients that were on this comet. And guess what? They discovered water vapor, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, 16 orga organic compounds, and even something called an amino acid. Is this life that we've discovered? No, it's not. But we believe that these organic compounds and amino acids are the precursors to life. And if they're common on every comet, and, and many asteroids and different things like that, all of those comets and asteroids that landed on planet Earth three to four billion years ago, they might have seeded life on planet Earth uh, because they had all of these compounds and brought it to, Earth, brought it to the early Earth that then started life uh, in a single cell format, then multi-cell format, then to evolve into animals and dinosaurs and humans that 
we now have on planet Earth now. So in closing, I wanted to say, at least in my opinion, I don't think it's a matter of if life exists in the universe, but rather how many, how intelligent, and when. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I'm really looking forward to your questions. Jesse, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Well, thank you so much, Tom. If you weren't awake already before this presentation, you sure are now. That was uh, extremely enthusiastic. So thank you so much for uh, such a cool tour and so many kids tuning in from across Canada and the U.S. and beyond. Uh, over 170 people or groups tuning in on YouTube. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of kids uh, from across the continent. So welcome in, everybody. And yeah, let's dive in with questions. I'm going to start with our live groups. I'm going to take some from Slido. Um, so we're going to start with Miss Pereira's group joining us in Chicago. If you guys want to kick us off with a question. Come on up, go for it. And, uh, Anya, do you want to ask a question? You have a yeah, thank you, Anya. Have, have, have you seen anything? Have you seen anything strange like UFOs or aliens? Okay, so good question. Have we seen anything to prove that UFOs really are aliens? Here's the thing about science. If you are going to make extraordinary claims you have to have extraordinary evidence. It's something that Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Just because someone says they saw an alien, well, I'm not gonna believe it because it might've been a dream. It might, might've been an illusion that they had. There's so many other reasons that those pieces of evidence don't raise themselves high enough to really prove that those aliens have in fact been here. So I encourage you to have a mind like a scientist. Don't just believe things tell you, but question it. Say, I don't believe that. I wanna see more evidence. What evidence do we have? I wanna see five different scientists or research groups all stand up and write a paper to say, yep, it is an alien. And here's why each of these five different groups from around the world are stating that fact. Until I see that, or maybe even until I see it myself, I, as a scientist, I won't believe it. So hopefully you'll be like that as well. Yeah, great question to kick us off, guys. All right, let's go to Ms. Hubert's class. Joining us in Acton, uh, Ontario. Welcome in, just demute that microphone and you're good to go. Yeah, hi, uh, my class has so many questions. So I'm gonna, I, I don't know how many you'll let us ask. So I'll just start with one. Um, okay, so th I thought this one was interesting. Uh, if, if you do find aliens of any kind, like that mi microbial, in whatever form, what are you gonna do? They wanna know. Okay, well, that's a good question. If it's microbial life, we'll just get real excited and spread the word and the whole world's gonna be excited about astronomy and space exploration and all that. I think it will be just amazing for planet Earth. And guess what? I believe in our lifetimes, especially all you kids in the classroom, I believe you are, are going to see a headline that that microbial alien life has in fact been found. So I'm looking forward to that. But the second part of the question, what would happen if we found intelligent life? That's a whole different question. If they landed on the White House lawn or whatever, are they friendly? Are they nice? Are they trying to teach us science or are they bombing our cities? Or So the reaction is just going to depend how they treat us and whether they're nice or not and whether we can learn from them and all those kinds of things. So that's interesting. Yeah, go ahead with another question. Yeah, if you wanna come right back, go for it. Um, Go for it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, if aliens do exist, whatever kind of alien life, um, what what do you think their world would likely look like, and what would the temperature range have to be? That's a great question. Yeah. So first of all, the primary place we look for life is anywhere that has water. It doesn't mean that's the only place we're going to find it but that's the first place we look. The second place we look is in something called the habitable zone, especially when we're looking at exoplanets trillions of kilometers away. We look for the habitable zone, the place that's just not too hot and not too cold, but it's in the right distance from their star so that liquid water can exist in the surface. And that's the place where we're most likely to find life. Secondly, what are they going to look like? That's a great, I love that question because there's so many different ranges of types of planets, half the size of Earth, five times the size of Earth, and those worlds will be very different. The atmosphere will be different. The gravity will be different if it's five times heavier, for uh, five times more massive. 
So life will be different in that example there. If, if that planet is five times more massive than Earth, then their legs are going to be like six feet wide and set, instead of like our skinny little legs because our gravity is different. So if their gravity is that intense, their entire infrastructure, their bodies is going to be different to withstand that pressure. And so that's, uh, that's how it might be different. I love that we're highlighting all these, these potential differences between life uh, across the universe. And this is something that science fiction has speculated on for so many decades now. You highlighted all these great examples of, of alien possibilities out there that Hollywood's come up with. So these are, are great questions to feed into that, guys. Thanks for uh, keeping it going. All right, we're going to go to the Tribune Trailblazers. Ms. McIntosh's group joining us in Brampton. Come on in. Go for hey it. there. Um, we're fascinated. Divjot is my space guy, and he wants to know if Proxima B is actually tidally locked because he thinks that would impact alien life forms living there. And also where the word alien came from. Why are aliens called aliens? Okay, great question. So uh, Proxima is the closest star, as I mentioned, to Earth. But guess what? It's actually a triple star system. A lot of people don't, don't realize that. Um, but that particular star, because it, it, it is so close to its, uh, be, because the planets close to that red dwarf star are so close, it is in fact believed that the planets orbiting Proxima uh, are probably tidally locked. What does that mean? That means the same side of the planet always faces their star. So how's that life how would that be life different than planet Earth? Well, we get a day and a night because our Earth is rotating. Well, guess what? If you're tidally locked, one half of the planet is always going to be facing the star. The other half is always going to be nighttime. And a little strip on the side is always going to have a sunset or sunrise. You wouldn't be able to call it either, but you'll see the sun just on the horizon and you'll, and you'll barely see it. So life will be different on those planets because do you want to live on the light side where it's daytime all the time? Or do you want to live on the dark side? Or do you want to maybe live on the day side, but go vacationing on the night side so you can do some astronomy and look at the stars? <laughs> uh, or do you want to vacation, uh, you know, where it's sunset so you can just sit there for an entire two week vacation and watch the sunset right in the exact same spot. So that also highlights how life is different on a planet, on an exoplanet that is tidally locked. And then Tom, for alien, do you know this offhand? Because I looked this up while we were while you were answering that question. Do you know where alien comes from? As no, a I, no, I don't actually. So it's it's is it just a made up word that we decided to call anything that's life beyond Earth? We it, just gave it that name. It goes I think. beyond that. So it's it's like way back to Latin. It means to belong to another. So before it ever referred to like creatures on other planets or other worlds, it was just something that was different. And we still talk about this sometimes in in. You know, human affairs, illegal aliens is an example of, of people that would be belonging to another place. So there's the, there's your background of your term. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank uh, you, Jesse. A quick question about tidal locking. Uh, so does the moon qualify as that with the Earth? Because we see the one side of it all the time. Yes, that's a good point. The moon is tidally locked to Earth. So we always see the same side. Now it does wobble a little bit. So we actually get to see about 59% of it, but pretty much the same side. Uh, a lot of people don't even realize, even on our solar system, Mercury is tidally locked to the sun. So if you happen to move to Mercury one day, you get to decide, do you want to live in, in the day side or on the night side? Do you want to melt or freeze? That's the question. <laughs> right. <laughs> 200 um, degrees above or 200 degrees below zero, right? <laughs> not I'm sticking with Toronto. Miss um, <laughs> Wafer's class is joining us from the Laurel Springs School, so she has students all over the world. Miss Wafer, come on in and take us away. Thank you. First of all, we're just learning so much. Um, Raven, one of our students, started asking about the Fermi paradox before you even um, mentioned it. So you did answer that question. We're students, um, as Jesse said, all over the world. We're an online school. We've been around for 30 years. We're going to celebrate our 30th anniversary this year. I have a group of students in a virtual classroom. And so then Raven, who's in 11th grade in Colorado, also wanted to know, you mentioned we're looking for life. Is there anything that's going to limit that, like the expansion of the universe or other factors? Are we on any kind of, you know, schedule to find life or are we open to finding life for quite some time? We're always open to finding life, but there is very much very specific limitations, as you mentioned. The biggest limitation, even finding microbial life in our solar system, 
Uh, Europa and Enceladus are encrusted in 20 kilometers thick sheets of ice. So for us to get through that, it might take us hundreds of years to, or, or decades to build the technology to drill down to be able to find the life. So that icy barrier is blocking us. Uh, the expansion of the universe uh, you mentioned. Yes, the universe is expanding and billions and billions of years from now, we won't even see any of those other galaxies other than our own local galaxies like Andromeda and, and uh, the Mag Magellanic clouds, etc. So there's no way we'll find life because all of those other galaxies would have spread past beyond the universe itself. The other limitations involve how we're going to communicate with them because these distances are so vast even if we got even if we got an alien signal that said hey it, it, we want to introduce ourselves and then we send a message back they might be 10,000 light years away from us so it'll take them 10,000 years before they'll get our answer saying hey nice to meet you <laughs> and then we'll have to wait another 10,000 years to get the answer back and the other comment I want to make on that one is, yeah, I just covered my solution of the Fermi paradox, but do some research. There's literally about 70 different solutions. One is there is no life beyond planet Earth. That's why we haven't met them. Another one is uh, the rare Earth hypothesis, hypothesis that no, life is so rare and, and life starting, even though it somehow got a foothold here, that process is so difficult that that they might not reach that threshold. Uh, another one is the simulated world hypothesis that we are actually, if you think about it, how incredible our 3D virtual games are these days, it almost looks like we're in a real world, doesn't it? Now imagine, see how much they've developed in the past 20 years. Think of how real our virtual games will look like a thousand or a million years from now. So one of the solutions to the Fermi paradox is, is, is exactly that that we are not real, we are just living in a simulated world. So some programmer built this 3D virtual simulated world and we're just walking around in a simulated world, not a real world. There's another one for you. <laughs> I'm gonna pinch myself, I think I'm real for now. We'll find out by the end of the broadcast. Um, we're gonna take a few quick questions from Slido and then we're gonna to go to our, our final three teachers for one question. Our live groups, if you guys are able to send me more questions via email after the fact, you all have our email address to exploring by the seat of your pants. We'll make sure Tom gets a chance to answer more, but we're close to the end of time. So we're gonna try and take as many as we can before we wrap up. One thing I love to note, Tom, and, and you mentioned aspects of this in your talk, is the idea that we've, we've barely started searching. So, I mean, if you had this cup and you went to the ocean and you dipped it in the ocean and went, oh, there's no fish in this cup, it would be inappropriate to say there's no fish in the ocean. We've barely started searching. So there's so much more to be done, which is really, really And, cool. and we don't even have a cup yet. We barely have a teaspoon. So that's why we don't know yet. Fantastic. Um, Tom, there's a whole bunch of questions on Slido about black holes. So I... You know, this doesn't necessarily relate to life in the universe, but people are really keen on black holes. If you could explain a little bit about what they are, that would be fantastic. Sure, but maybe we should do a black hole session one day. We can just talk can about black that. holes. We, we can do that. <laughs> okay, I'll pick an alien question then. So this, yeah. this water you mentioned on Mars, would it be drinkable for humans? Is this something where if we find water, it's usable by life wherever it might be? If it's water, is it just water or is it going to be different or what the deal? Yes. So it, it could be H2O is the elements that make up water, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, so it could be, but once again, on different planets, there might be many other ingredients that are part of that pool of whatever it is. And it's most likely not going to be just pure water. So it's likely going to be something that we'll have to filter out to make it drinkable. But guess what? Scientists really believe because of how much frozen ice that that uh, has been found on mars that once our mars space colony does get there yes we will be able to melt that ice and we will be able to filter out any harmful stuff in it and we will be able to drink it but guess what the other thing we can do with that water h2o we can use the hydrogen we can split up the h and the o the hydrogen and the oxygen so we can use the oxygen to breathe and then we can even use the hydrogen to build rocket fuel so that the Martian colonists can get a ride back to planet Earth again. So that ice on Mars is going to be very, very handy for us. Super cool. Um, all right, let's head to Miss Teeter's class. Uh, come on in, just demute that microphone, and you're good to go. I always do that. 
First of all, thank you, Tom. We are so intrigued. We're learning so much from this presentation. It's amazing. Um, a question that we had, we had a great talk about aliens this morning, which was awesome. But a personal question for you, which planet do you think will be the next one to find life, whether it's intelligent or less intelligent? Um, and what timeline do you think that will be? How long do you think it will be to find it? Yeah, great question. So uh, I believe, A, that it's going to be microbial life. I believe that we're going to find it in our solar system. And I truly believe that in our lifetimes, we are actually going to see that headline that microbial life has been found. I think it's going to take us many decades <laughs> before we actually get to that point. And if I had to bet, oh boy, <laughs> it's, it's probably, it's probably going to be underground in Mars because we have actually found uh, through radar techniques, uh, scanning Mars, that it's likely that there's pools of water that exist uh, potentially a, a couple of hundred meters down in Mars. And once again, when we have deep caves on planet Earth where water and even, even sulfuric acid and, and different harsh ele elements exist, and there's no sunlight in those caves at all, we're actually finding life on Earth in those places. So why wouldn't we find it there in those caves? So I would say that's probably the best bet. I'd have to go for second, either Europa or Enceladus, uh, the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. But I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to dig through those ice shields uh, in our lifetimes. Yeah. It's really interesting getting to bring on uh, NASA astronauts, explorers, engineers, people like Tom that uh, you know uh, talk about life in the universe. And so Tom hit upon three of the four: Titan, the moon of Saturn, is the only other one that people consistently say when they're thinking about life in the universe. So three moons, one planet. Hopefully, we get a chance to explore those in, in much more detail in the coming years. Certainly, Mars. There are many robotic missions active on Mars and around Mars that we're, we're doing and planning for right now. And in February, I think it is, we have our next big rover landing. Um, landing there, which is very exciting. So, yeah. Excellent. And I don't, and I, I'll just give the quick answer to that black hole question, just to get them excited about a future session we might do. And that is that the simple de definition of a black hole is an object that's so dense that not even light can escape. And the way it's typically created is that a huge star explodes in a huge supernova explosion and then collapses in on itself to create this incredibly dense thing called a black hole that not even light can escape. And just a year or two ago, scientists have actually taken the first picture of a black hole that we'll show you if we do that session. And that particular black hole now finally proves uh, what Einstein Einstein's theories suggested 100 years ago that black holes might actually exist. And, and now we have pretty strong evidence that they exist all over the place, including a supermassive one in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. So I'm going to ask, I can see them in the background on YouTube. If you want Tom to do a black hole session, you can say yes on YouTube. For our live groups, what do you guys think? Raise your hand if you want Tom to do a black hole session. Everyone's hands are up. Okay, I think we're going to have to make that happen, Tom. I'm excited. Okay. Um, let's take our last two questions. Miss Neely's class joining us in King Carton. Come on in, go for it. Hmm. Oh. My daughter's gonna ask the question for the class. Thank you, <laughs> go ahead. What is the fire gift set up the outer space? Someone repeat the question for me. Thank you for asking what, the question. What is the fire gift um, to study the study outer space? What was your inspiration for the, your studies? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Oh, man, I've had so many inspirations, but a couple of my inspirations were literally just going on YouTube. This one day, I'll never forget, I was watching YouTube one day, and I watched this concept called ga galactic cannibalism that showed how galaxies collide together and merge together, and their 200 billion stars are just merging together. And, and almost just like a, a living, breathing thing. When I was growing up, I always thought stars are just these things that kind of just sit there in the sky and don't move. And it's like this living, breathing organism of these stars all merging together. And that was one of my earliest inspirations for getting involved in astronomy and science. Another one was just watching science fiction like Star Trek and other things like that. And that got me excited about uh, tractor beams and, and how they can communicate on their communicators and how they can get beam, beam me up, Scotty, to beam you up from the planet up to the spaceship. All of that stuff really fascinated me. 
fantastic, Tom. Um, all right, we're going to wrap up with one more question from Miss W. Uh, again, we're so enthused. We're going over time. We didn't even get a chance to do a second round. You guys are the best of all these great questions. Miss W, do you want to come on in? Go for oh, it. Great. You, hi. Can you hi. Um, so we had a bunch of questions. I'm just going to check. I thought you meant Ms. Wafer. <laughs> um, so if you do find intelligent life, asks Erica, how would you communicate with them? There's not a big chance that they'll speak the languages here on earth that we're used to. That's right. It would be very difficult. So, so we wouldn't speak their language, but guess what? One of the things that's interesting is the language of mathematics might be the same between earthlings and, and aliens, because guess what? They have all the same laws of physics and rules and gravity that we do and all of the same mathematical formulas that apply to all that stuff. So that might be one way that we have to start the conversation, but hopefully from there we can draw pictures and use music and other things just to communicate our thoughts and feelings and things like that. But it wouldn't be easy to do. I see exactly what you're saying. Yeah. One thing I'd really like to encourage our classes as this session draws to a close to check out when you're done. In addition to Tom, he's done uh, TEDx talks, he's done all sorts of other presentations, and we're going to have him back for Black Holes, obviously, um, is the Voyager missions and the Golden Record. So speaking to this point of trying to communicate with alien life, humans in the late 70s sent out missions that are now outside of the influence of the sun. They're th at the time, they were the fastest missions ever sent off the planet Earth. And oh, go ahead, Tom. And the idea was to send an interstellar message in a bottle. So the Golden Record is just incredible stuff. That's great. Uh, yeah, Jesse, I just wanted to wrap up with a, a couple of comments. I, I wanted to tell people I have a free gift for everybody. Uh, Jesse, if you can't see my screen, uh, let me know. I'm just going to read it off and you can post it on YouTube. Uh, I wanted to give everyone a free copy of my book, uh, which contains like hundreds of links to videos about life in the universe and TED Talks and TV documentaries and all kinds of things like that. Jesse, can you see my screen by any chance? We've got that up so everyone can copy that link. Uh, you can all get that up. In fact, I'll bring it up in a banner as well so we all have it. Um, but yeah, and also if you put it on the YouTube link as well, this is a case sensitive address so you have to type it in exactly like that and you can download a free copy. It's split up into different sections. I'm pretty sure I have a life in the universe section in there as well. So feel free to uh, peruse that and watch a whole bunch of videos and immerse yourself in astronomy and space exploration. Tom, you rock, man. This is so much fun. Oh, uh, so I've loved yeah, that. Can I, give them, can, can I give them one last thought experiment to leave them with to think about for the next week? Of course. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay. The last one I'll leave you with is there's this concept in life in the universe called panspermia, where we think that panspermia says life uh, and microbial life might get exchanged between planets. <clears throat> so three or four billion years ago, for example, Mars had all kinds of water on its surface, and it might have been even better in the habitable zone at that time in terms of having water and life and, and all that. And when an asteroid hit Mars, it could have blown up that microbial life into, the, into space. And there's a good chance, because we've already found Mars rocks on Earth, that many of those uh, rocks found their way to Earth. And there's also a small possibility that some of that early microbial life and organic compounds and amino acids could have landed on Earth and seeded life on planet Earth. So okay. guess what? We might be all uh, descendants of Martians. Okay, so tell that to your friends. <laughs> There's your thought experiment for the day. Tom, always such a pleasure. This was such a great talk. And thank you so much for providing the link to all those amazing resources online. Uh, everyone has that. It's been in the chat. You guys can watch the YouTube video again and see that. And I will send it to all our groups that registered for this program as well. Tom, as you know, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers. So Chicago, Brampton, Acton, uh, Laurel Springs School, Quell, all over the place. King Card, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you, Tom. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.